Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of ownership structures. And I specifically contrast private ownership, be it family or some sort of a private partnership, um, uh, with public ownership. And there are some sort of combinations like there that we talk about as well, like joint ventures. Um, I talk about professional management with a private business where you bring in external managers. But it's basically a contrast of ownership structures, the advantages and disadvantages. And I think that there are three particular audiences that this is most relevant to. The first one is private business owners or family business owners. And that is, uh, there's a lot to be said about issues specifically to that form of ownership like succession and uh, grooming the next generation and so there's some family issues there's also some how you should manage a structure a private deal for partnerships and we also talk about the advantages of going public obviously that's for um, larger companies but you don't have to be that large because there are over-the-counter stocks um, the second audience that I think that this is relevant to so that was private and family business owners is the advisors to different owners of businesses especially businesses you know trying to help people decide what the right structure what the right ownership form is for their business so that might be bankers or deal brokers and the third one is just a general business audience this is something that's relevant and is oftentimes taught in business curricula but i feel it's just a little bit in finance and then a little bit in strategy and nobody ever pulls together the choices about ownership structure in one place in most business educations. So I wanted to do that. Um, I should also state that depending on who the, who the majority of the audience this is being delivered to, uh, it can be varied. So for example, if it's, if it's an audience of, of family business owners or even just an industry where most of the businesses are owned by families, like certain uh, business practices or uh, you know, dry cleaners tend to be sort of a local business, those kinds of things. Um, I can build a lot of this out, like some of the gen intergenerational issues. I have a lot of information on that, but I'm gonna keep that short in this presentation just to hit several different, um, several different uh, topics for the sample. So let's start off with the family business and the advantages of it specifically. Um, the first one is you get a commitment to the business and uh, the generations, uh, multi-generational families tend to be more committed to their business than some other ownership structures like uh, public ownership especially. Uh, the second one is it tends to be a source of income for the family over the generations. Thirdly, it can be an opportunity for, it, for the family members to have an occupation, a gainful employment. Um, and the last one I put sort of a traditional romantic notion, stewardship. I think a lot of times business founders, especially, the, the, the business becomes sort of like one of their children and they wanna make sure that it's carried on in the way that they would see fit and their family is the best way to do that. Um, with that said though, you could also counter a lot of these advantages with the disadvantages. So for example, they might be more committed to the business, but that can actually result in overcommitment. Perhaps if they're emotionally vested in long-term employees, they might not be willing to make difficult choices that can uh, actually strengthen the business for the long term. Um, secondly, you face the issue of overconcentration. If you look at most businesses, most family families whose wealth is derived from the ownership of a business, they tend to do worse than families who don't because concentrating in a mature market tends to involve additional risk and you want to diversify away from that. So you actually, the, the, um, the income might, might actually be higher if you were to sell the business and diversify it. And you remember, you might say, well, you know, this is a source of income for my family. But in theory, the value of a business is the future cash flows. So you should be able to actually monetize that through a sale or, or some other structure we're gonna talk about so that the family can have a large sum of money to live off of rather than just a, uh, a, a income paid on a, on a regular basis. But it's not necessarily less money to do a different, uh, different way. Also, the, we talk about being you know, a resource, a source for income or opportunity. I think there's a big debate as to whether or not, is it, a, depending on how you, it depends on how you look at it. Is it a resource or is it a burden? Because if the children want, are encouraged to take over the family business or they realize their best chance to make high incomes is to take over the family business, but that, that will prevent them from pursuing other opportunities. And as we've already said, even if it's a matter of money, if you were to sell the business and you could then use that money to in, indulge them and in uh, to support them in pursuing some of the other pursuits that they 
that they might be more interested in. So it kind of depends on how you look at it. Also, if you talk about succession, which is the next point I want to make, um, oftentimes there will be a, uh, a child who is put in charge of the business who takes a disproportionate leadership role and sometimes the, the, the children can end up fighting over that um, but you can also end up with the opposite phenomenon with whoever ends up being the leader feels that they are bearing the burden of keeping the business going to support their other siblings who might have more independence. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about those things. Um, I want to end up on family businesses with what we call best practices slash mistakes to avoid. And one of the things that we talked about right there is succession planning. Um, I, uh, well, let me stop and take a step back and just say in, in terms of best practices in family businesses, it's interesting to note that most uh, cultures have uh, a variation of the expression you know from sh shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations and that expression usually means that family businesses sort of tend to go up and down in about three generations there's the first generation that starts it the second generation that flourishes and the third generation that declines and it's important to note that that is uh, that's a common expression but it's actually found in in various cultures around the world in ver in different languages where it grew up independently which says that this is something that tends to happen regardless of culture so you got to watch for that uh, cycle that life cycle for your family business so succession we already talked a little bit about it. sometimes you want to choose a a leader and it also might be uh, uh, difficult if there are changes to that um, position like if you appoint a leader when they're young and the other siblings don't want to take an interest but then maybe some of them come back and decide later that they would like to or the the person put in charge in the leadership role uh, doesn't work out um, you also have issues where oftentimes the parents will put an, anoint someone a leader but continue to control the reins themselves and this confuses the employees because they ask the the uh, putative leader what they should do but in reality they always end up going over their head to the parents because they know that's where the real decisions are made so there's a lot of issues about that there's also issues about grooming the next generation so if you have someone that you want to take part in the business do you keep them in the business as they grow up so they learn it top to bottom or do you put them out do you send them away before they come back to the business so they can get some external experience running other businesses and and learn how things work other than their own family business which where uh, they might be treated a little bit specially and it might underdevelop them that way and the last one i wanted to talk about there this is just a common mistake to avoid oftentimes you can end up in a situation where the family gets so used to the income of the business that they start uh, have, having sort of certain fixed costs that they need to have serviced by the business and as a result of that they're not running the business they're not running the business to, to make income the business is being run to serve the income essentially the tail wags the dog and so they might be uh, not being not taking enough risk not making new investments be, uh, and, and henceforth hurting the business because they're having to pay for the lifestyle that they've adjusted to so that is a little bit on family businesses and by extension a, a sort of a certain subset of private businesses um, I also want to talk uh, let's let's start out or let's move from there to the other extreme and that is a public company and let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this public company as most of you know is when you uh, sell it uh, issue stock or allow any member of the public to buy it there are several op advantages to that one of them is the cash you get the cash for the family like I said instead of having an annual income or regular income you get it all in one lump sum uh, another event so it's a good way to cash out also if there are certain siblings who don't want to be dependent on the income or invested in the business it gives them an option to leave by selling their shares while allowing other members of the family who want to stay invested to do so so you can it's, it's an option there Another advantage is it gives you a reasonable valuation metric for the business. It allows the public markets to determine what they think the value of the business is. And that way, uh, if you're going to do something like cash out or sell shares, you don't have to argue about pricing or if you're going to do partnerships. Another advantage is it raises capital. If you're interested in expanding the business and you want to issue some stock, that will bring more cash into the business that allows you to uh, invest in some of those other opportunities. It also might bring exposure or prestige to the business, and that can be good in terms of uh, giving yourself some exposure in the market. You might have partners who want to do business with you because you're a publicly held company and they've heard about you or seen something about you as well. And then the last one is it's a currency for mergers and acquisitions. Oftentimes, if you want to buy a company, uh, you know, you can finance a transaction with cash, but you can also finance it with stock. And so the going public gives you that option.
Now let's talk about some of the disadvantages of public ownership. Obviously the big one is you have to give up a certain measure of control. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to mitigate that, but that's, that's one thing that the family chase uh, faces. Secondly, you don't get to choose your owners anymore. Once it's on a public market, it can be bought by uh, anybody in, the, in, in the, uh, the herd out there. Can The thundering herd can have their own opinions about how the business should be run. They might be difficult to uh, manage relationships with. And also you might get activist investors, hedge funds, uh, people who want to force change in the business buying up large shares of the stock. So you lose the ability to choose your owners when you go public. You also um, run the risk of, as you fra when you go public, you, you typically fragment the ownership structure. And uh, I, not to give executives a bad name, but there are some schools of thought that say they oftentimes end up sort of self-dealing and treating the business like their own sort of personal piggy bank, their own little empire. <clears throat> and with a fragmented ownership structure, that becomes easier. Whereas if it was owned by a concentrated small group of family members or private individual it would be harder for them to do so because there'd be some more discipline there'd be some more oversight also uh, there's some debates as to whether or not that makes the business think short term uh, because now they have to meet quarterly earnings expectations or something like that it's important to note though is that is that a good thing or a bad thing i mean maybe it's good that they have short-term thinking because it makes them responsible and they won't indulge in uh, uh, over commitment uh, but also you know the downside is maybe they would undercommit. So that can cut both ways. There's also filing, you know, when you're going to file for your public interest, uh, pardon me, to go public and when you're going to do, uh, uh, communicate with investors and keep up your SEC filings on a regular basis, there are costs associated to that both financial, the dollars and checks, and also in management attention. And then finally, you got to remember that when you go public, you're going to be issuing statements to your shareholders and your competitors can see those things and find out how much money you're making. Also, your suppliers can and decide if they're if maybe you're making too much money and they'd like a bigger share of the pie themselves. And likewise, your customers can decide if you're making too much money, maybe they're being overcharged. So that's the, the plus and minus of a public ownership structure. Now let's talk a little bit, so I started out with both extremes. Let's talk about some of the uh, ad, sort of uh, hybrid approaches. One of them is you can have a family business or a private business, but appoint professional managers. This is uh, assuming that the outsiders would be um, better than perhaps some of the groomed internal family members. And that is a that can be the best of both worlds or that can be the worst of both worlds. The best of both worlds is when you maintain family ownership and family commitment to the business, but the professional managers, uh, you're, you're able to pick and choose the best managers on the market and you end up doing ha having better performance. But you can also end up with the worst of both worlds where you have a private business, but the professional managers, as we sort of talked about, manage to sort of get in, ingratiate themselves into the business and uh, exploit it for their own benefit. And that's especially true if the generations aren't keeping a close track on that and they sort of uh, take, their, take their eye off the ball, so to speak, and the managers end up sort of running it for their own benefit. Uh, a good example of that is with the Wall Street Journal. They actually lost control of the business because the parent, uh, the the generations got so far removed from the management that they weren't even sure that they wanted to sell to Rupert Murdoch when he is the activist investor, like we talked about, uh, made an offer for the business and uh, they really couldn't turn it down. They weren't prepared for it. Also, it's important to note that um, historically speaking, when you bring in external managers at a premium, sort of the hired guns, uh, and this is not specific to private businesses, this is general as well, uh, for public companies as well. But hired guns tend to underperform internally groomed managers. That's not necessarily a family manager, that could be, just be someone within the business. But that's, um, the research has indicated that, so that's something to bear in mind when you decide if you're getting the best of both worlds or the worst. Another thing that we, I'd like to talk about briefly is partnerships and joint ventures. These can work very well when there's something sort of complementary. You know, you have the production capacity, but someone else from another region that you'd like to go into has a good market, uh, has good relationships there, and you can sort of form a partnership. Um, it's also important to note, you don't have to make this all one, all one entity. You can have separate legal entities to serve your partnerships if you're going into a different area. Uh, region or, or market such as that. Um, but sometimes it ends up being the whole thing. 
uh, one entity that you actually combine with another partner. Um, another thing I want to talk about is joint ventures, which is kind of a variation on that theme. And I've found that a lot of joint ventures don't work out in the long term. This is sort of my uh, anecdotal experience. And I think the reason for that is uh, they're either uh, too good or not good enough. If they're not good, if they don't work out, they're not lucrative, then nobody wants to support the joint venture. But if they're too good, everybody wants it for themselves and they start to fight over it. And if they can't get control of the whole thing, they start to do a separate uh, entity where they do own all of, and then they end up fighting between the joint venture and the contracts. Uh, a good example of this was um, Amazon, uh, pardon me, Starbucks. Uh, Kraft wanted to license the Starbucks name to sell coffee in retail. Starbucks said, fine, that's incremental uh, incremental growth for us. But it turns out that started being very successful and Starbucks growth ran out in their uh, coffee shops because they had uh, fully fully developed the market. You know how common they are. And so as a result, they ended up uh, being frustrated. That they were stuck in this joint venture with Kraft. They would have rather owned it themselves and gotten all the upside to themselves. So joint ventures can fail because they're either not successful or successful. And so as a result, you end up with a lot of uh, joint ventures. You, you're, it seems like I'm always reading an article about another joint venture that went bad. Not, uh, theoretically, there can be advantages, but, the, but the, the track record is decidedly mixed, shall we say. Another possibility you have is private equity, and that is, you know, if you have a privately owned company, you essentially keep it private, but you sell it to another investment group rather than going public. Um, there's a debate as to whether or not that gives them a more long-term focus or short. They will tell you that that makes them more long-term focused because they're not worried about those quarterly earnings statements and that's tr and so they can make big investments there's some truth to that but it's also important to note most private equity firms with some exceptions like Warren Buffett's but most of them are interested in exiting within a few years selling the business and uh, returning the income the the appreciation to their investors so in reality oftentimes if they're only going to be in there for three to five years they'll drop investment dramatically low to make the company look artificially profitable so that when they sell it they can get a higher price for it and then the person who buys it ends up realizing that it had been underfunded and it's not nearly as profitable as they thought they were if they want to invest in it and keep it going so there's a debate as to whether or not pri private equity is long term because they aren't interested in the quarters but they're still short term because they are interested in only a few years uh, another thing to consider is, um, I would say more skills or less private equity oftentimes to, likes to present themselves as the professional management group because they have skills from other industries to bring into your own. That's generally true, but then there's also the argument of if they're coming from the outside, maybe they don't have the skills requisite requisite skills and understanding of the inside of that industry. So that's, that's another debatable point with private equity. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about what I call sell a stake which means you're selling a stake in the firm, but not the whole thing. And one option for this is, uh, one, one variation of this would be if you allow some of the shares to be sold publicly, but you, keep, but you can actually have two share classes, and so the income gets promised to the public, but the voting shares, control of the company, the decision making, stays with your private or family business. And the, that's, that's one option that companies like Brown Foreman, who makes Jack Daniels, they have a structure like that. But it's important to remember, even if you maintain decision making within your private ownership, you still have a fiduciary duty to the public. So even though you have more control, you don't have absolute control. You can't do anything that the public could argue is against their fiduciary uh, interests or they can file a shareholder lawsuit. So for example, if you have a takeover offer that's a high price and you have this dual class structure, the, f the family can't just say no because they don't want to sell. If it's in the interests of the shareholders in general, if the offer is generous enough, they actually have to, they can be forced to sell. Um, last thing I want to talk about is the advisors. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk about selling stakes or even just going public, um, a lot of the advisors that you might be interested in are, uh, a lot of the advisors that might be helping you are paid on uh, a deal basis, maybe a percentage of the deal. And so they might be more interested in creating partnerships, uh, going public, selling to someone, because if they're paid on a sale, the option of doing nothing doesn't make them any money. And so there's a conflict of interest thing to bear in mind there. So anyway, that's, that's a sample of my ownership structure presentation. I hope you found this interesting. If you'd like to see something like this presented for your organization or at your event, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.